I got it. What are you wearing? I... I was wearing this before. I said flour and yeast. We can't eat toilet paper. dream again yeah this section we're heading into dreams talking about the kind of dreams you may have do they mean anything different categories in their most common dreams we have like we mentioned earlier though and we've mentioned a couple times through here our problems in studying dreams especially if we want to figure out what are your patterns of dreams that you have we're still limited to the dreams you can remember. We still rely on self-report. It's not like we can read your brain and display your brain or display your dreams on a screen to see what's going on. Ooh, or can we? <laughs> oh. Can computers read our brains and know what we're seeing? They're now a small step closer. Researchers at Purdue University are using artificial neural networks to decode real neural networks. They scanned three women's brains as they watched videos and recorded brain activity in response to each clip. An AI algorithm successfully learned to predict how their brains would respond to new clips. Another algorithm learned to look at their brains and predict what they saw. The reconstructed images looked like fuzzy ghosts, but the AI could at least guess the category of the content, birds, faces, and so on. The researchers are using artificial intelligence to understand the brain in order to further improve AI. We're making some interesting strides there. That could be pretty interesting. Take a look at this set um, from the study mentioned in the video, and this study is also posted on uh, Canvas if you want to look at it in detail. The pictures on the far left here, the little boxes, are the pictures the people were shown or were looking at. And then each of those other boxes are different scans using different layers. And again, that's just from reading the brain. Uh, and the key point here is we have to do readings and collect a database on each individual because specific synaptic patterns in your brain vary from one person to another. So something that would cause a certain pattern in one person doesn't cause the same pattern in another. So the database they were using to do this wouldn't work on anyone. They would have to build a database for each individual. Um, so you can see as you go down those, some of them, I mean, the lion there or tiger, I can't tell in the picture I'm looking at. Uh, kind of looks like a chihuahua in a lot of those. The swan is the one because there's the least detail in it. But really, you get down onto the right there, and it looks pretty good. Again, these are just scans from reading the brain. We have another set here. Um, and again, none of these are clear. But if you know what the original picture was, you can kind of get an idea uh, of what it is. It's really hazy in there. So that's the kind of thing they're looking at here right now, reading... The brain there will never get I mean we're a long ways away from getting very detailed on that because you can only do so much with an fMRI because it is showing activity in big clusters of cells we have to be able to read in very good detail to start getting a clearer picture at the moment we have no tech that can do that from the outside we'd probably someone would have to design 
a little kind of fabric neural net that we actually open up your brain and lay it across uh, the visual cortex to get more detailed readings there. Now you may wonder if we could read stuff and display it on a screen, if a computer can interpret that, can it send signals? Could we have a computer take an image that we want to be able to see and insert it into our brains? That would be a completely different process. It'd be extremely complex. The easier way to do that is something they're working on right now when it comes to helping restore vision in people. And that is instead of dealing with the millions of different pathways in the occipital lobe, to just deal with um, the optic nerve, to design a little camera that sends signals through the optic nerve and then lets the brain interpret it on that end. So if you're wondering if we're heading toward a time where you could plug in and a video game would display in your head using your senses, we're a long ways away from that, but it's not completely impossible to do that. So we're gonna be talking about dreams here Let's hit one that we did talk about earlier, um, earlier in this series, because you'll hear things, uh, you can Google stuff and people will say, oh, you can't dream of new people. Everyone in your dream, even if it's a stranger, is someone you have seen at some point and your brain encoded their face. Again, we can't know that. There's no way to empirically prove that. And given the incredible creative tool our brain is, and its ability to just recreate uh, or create scenes we've never seen and experienced, it's very likely that we can create new people in our dreams. And here's the other one though, when we can plug in and see your dreams on the screen, you're gonna find a lot of the people in your dreams are probably really creepy looking because their faces are not in tremendous detail. Again, in the dream, you have knowledge of who a particular person is, but the facial features are not necessarily complete, and you don't notice that or pay any attention to it in a dream. People have said we can't see in color in a dream. Yeah, you can. You can actually dream in extremely vivid color because what's producing the visuals in your dream is the same part of your brain that processes images from your eyes the occipital lobe, the visual cortex. Again, if we took that part of your brain out, you would be blind, you would see nothing, but you also wouldn't dream visually anymore either. And you wouldn't be able to imagine visual scenes because it's that part of the brain that does it. Anything this can process from the senses, it can recreate uh, in a dream. So your brain can pick up, make new people, make new places, make events that you've never seen, never experienced, but again, in a, in a dream, quite often your brain is grabbing bits and pieces out of memory, so it will grab components of things you're familiar with. The other one, we've hit this before, time and space, the laws of physics, none of that matters in dreams. And this is why you can have a problem in your day-to-day -day life, and you dream about it, and you come up with a solution in the dream that makes perfect sense, but then you wake up and you realize that actually makes no sense. Like say you're behind on the rent, you need money, and you realize that all you have to do is take two eggs, wrap them in some toilet paper, duct tape it, and then bury it near the base of a tree, and then later when you come back, money will have formed from it. In a dream, that may make perfect sense, but obviously that's not really going to work. All sorts of violations of reality are possible uh, in dreams, and we don't even notice most of them. You can have a dream where uh, you're in a place that is both in Centralia and in Spokane at the same time, where uh, here's where I live that's in this town, but the store I go to is a store I remember from another town, and it doesn't uh, hit you at all within the dream that that's odd or not possible. Um, and we're going to see in a while what causes some of the different perceptions you may have in dreams. Here's just some of the more common dreams. We're going to talk about some of these later. Uh, as far as when we get into areas of what may cause you to have them. Flying, very common, flying or floating. Uh, falling, your teeth or hair falling out, being chased by someone or something. Being naked in public, very common one. Uh, any dreams of failure or being ridiculed, those are really common. Um, also, and there's a couple others we're going to throw in here also. 
But when we look at especially what causes sensation in dreams, like the falling or the floating, um, we got to come back to the brain. And what we're going to pay attention here primarily is that red line right there, the somatosensory cortex. It's right the frontal air, uh, area. Now, this makes it look like it's separate from the parietal lobe. Somatosensory cortex is actually considered part of the parietal lobe. And if we take a slice of that, the somatosensory cortex is what delivers sensation from every part of your body. So you see a little diagram here that shows a line of the somatosensory cortex and has parts of the body laid out over it. And you can see the parts of your body that are more sensitive to touch have more cortex dedicated to them. Across the central sulcus from the somatosensory cortex is the motor cortex. It has a map very similar to this. The motor cortex is what sends signals uh, to move. And it has more cortex dedicated areas that have more detailed motion to them, such as your mouth and your fingers. So this is what can cause phantom limb sensation. Because again, when we say sensation is all in your head, it literally is. Uh, a nerve sends a signal, but you don't feel it until it hits the somatosensory cortex, the corresponding part there. That's why I could lop off my arm but the cortex associated with my arm is still there and it may just start randomly firing and it will cause me to feel my arm is there. It's what we call phantom limb sensation. So if you can do that in waking, obviously you can have any body sensation um, in a dream that you would have otherwise. And this is going to play into some of these. When we say sensation dreams, um, when you're sleeping and as you're going through the different cycles of sleep, um, your brain's processing, ex of processing of external stimuli will kind of come and go over time. Uh, one of them that is a good example is hearing. If you've ever been on a road trip and you're nodding off in the car, even with the sound, the road noise around you, you may have a sudden perception that everything goes silent and that may pop you awake and things didn't go silent, it's just your auditory cortex briefly stopped processing the external stimuli and you were consciously aware of it and that startled you awake. So as these come and go, when you're dreaming, you can have different sensations here. So parietal lobe, as we saw, kind of the top going back, that deals with your sensation of space and positions of things in space and the position of your body. It doesn't just deal with the sensations coming from the body. It deals with your knowledge of what position your body is in. So my parietal lobe is what allows me to know where my hand is, even though I can't see it, it's behind me. It lets me know where in space, gives me a feeling of where in space my hand is. So I could toss a ball over my head and catch it because it would know where it is. So body sensation is part of that. So this is where, as you're starting to fall asleep, a common, um, one of the hallucinations you can have is that you suddenly fall and that jerks you awake. That's your parietal lobe disconnecting from the feeling of where your body really is and you have a perception you're dropping in there. You can also have the perception of floating uh, along with that. Dreams of your teeth and hair falling out, those can also be associated with anxiety or concerns about personal appearance but they can also be a parietal lobe issue because once parietal lobe is shutting off that sensation, you don't feel your teeth and gums anymore. Uh, you're not feeling any sensation up here, which may produce a dream that your teeth have actually fallen out, that they're not there anymore. Parietal lobe is also central to out-of-body experience, that sensation that you actually float out of your body and travel or maybe even look back at your body. Um, not to ruin it for anyone, but it, when we look at some of the out-of-body experiences that have been document, documented and thought to be pretty accurate, such as people uh, having surgery who report they floated out of their body and they saw everything going on in the room and they can even tell you who was in the room, they're actually not always accurate. And what makes us believe this is a reconstruction from what's coming in through the auditory senses is that the only people they report seeing in the room is the people who were talking during that time. If there was any staff in the room who were helping but did not talk, 
the person does not report having seen them. If you really were out of body and seeing the environment, you would see everyone. Also, if any of the people had been wearing different scrubs when they first wheeled the person in and changed, the scrubs they saw in their out-of-body experience weren't the ones the people were wearing at that moment. It was the ones the person had seen earlier. So um, not really a lot of evidence for that being a genuine thing as far as really floating out of your body and seeing the environment. So on the other end, we shut off those things and have weird perceptions because those are shut off. We're going to see another uh, issue around that in a moment. The other one is things coming in from the environment can enter your dream. If your body temperature is too warm or cold, you may have a dream of being too warm or too cold. We mentioned earlier people with sleep apnea where you will stop breathing while you're asleep. If you're dreaming during that, you may have a dream of suffocating or drowning or some case where you can't breathe. If you're ill, the feelings of the illness such as nausea or headache may come into your dream with you. If you fall asleep, as the slide says here, if you fall asleep with the television on, your ears may still be processing the audio um, and your visual cortex will start to create its own images that go along with that uh, entering in. If you have a clock radio that comes on in the morning, it may not wake you up, but music or something from the radio may enter your dream. So related to that, we called those sensation dreams here we have some we call sensory dreams, and these are things where in the dream suddenly you can't see clearly. You're having trouble focusing on things, and you can't focus in clearly. Or you can't hear something when you're trying to hear it. Or you're having trouble balancing, or you're trying to walk and you can't stay straight, and you keep falling down, or you're trying to run and you can't run, you can't get your legs to move. Uh, so either trouble running or you're completely paralyzed and can't move at all. This, um, this usually occurs when within the dream, you try to utilize your actual senses. So in a dream, when I'm trying to focus on something and see, my brain is trying to use my actual eyes to do that, but they're not sending any signal. So you kind of get this weird overlap between what the dream is trying to produce, but you're trying to focus in real vision on it, and that's not showing you anything. Same trouble with hearing. In the balancing, standing, or running, that's your parietal lobe doing that. I'm trying to use actual motor function. Um, well, parietal lobe and frontal lobe, because we're going over to the motor cortex here. So the balancing, standing, or running, that's most likely to occur in REM. Remember, REM is the state where your brain is most active. And in fact, you are sending motor signals, but the pons in the brainstem is interrupting them. So if I'm trying to actually run or walk, I'm trying to send motor signals to use my real muscles, they're not getting any feedback. So within the dream, they don't seem to be working. Paralyzed in a dream, quite often that's also a REM state because as we mentioned, sleep paralysis occurs during REM where you are literally paralyzed. Your body is not, uh, your muscles are not functional during that time because that's being cut off. And that's one where if you wake suddenly from that state, you can have a brief period of paralysis after that until the pons kicks things back on. So it's really weird when you're trying to use your real senses when you're in a dream state. So here we go back to the brain and you'll see um, somatosensory cortex and then the central sulcus is just an area where the two areas kind of fold in on each other. And then you have primary motor cortex, which is part of the frontal lobe that's what sends all motor signals to your body to do things. So uh, in REM, especially when those are trying to do their job, but they're not getting any feedback from the body, you can have strange experiences in your dreams because of that. Amnesia is another one you can experience in the dream when you realize you can't remember things. And a really common one here is at some point in a dream, you're trying to remember how you got where you are. And of course, because you're in a dream, you just popped into it. You don't actually have any memory of having arrived there because you just popped in, but you're trying to access actual memory again in this case. You're trying to access a real episodic memory of what did I do just before now and what did I do just before that? 
well actually in the current dream you're in you didn't do anything because you just popped into that so that can be an interesting experience of what it feels like to have amnesia of trying to reach back and find something and not being able to access it then another one that's really common is the bathroom anything around bathrooms toilets using the bathroom these are really common um, some suggest that we seek out bathrooms and dreams just because they're private places and therefore may feel safe but usually the most common one is your body actually does need to use the bathroom it's getting close to that so it's starting to kind of send that it's a precursor to waking up to use the bathroom um, but some of the frequent bathroom related dreams you're trying to find one because you need to go and you can't find one uh, you have found one but as you're using the toilet it is suddenly somewhere else like say you're sitting on a toilet starts in the bathroom but then your dream shifts suddenly and you find you're in the classroom during a lecture but you're still sitting on the toilet you have still used it and like now you don't want anyone to know what you're doing and you need to wipe and you don't want anyone to see it but now you're completely exposed what do you do there uh, another one is using something inappropriate as a toilet maybe using a sink or deciding within the dream that peeing on this blanket is okay so you start to pee on a blanket um, now just because you eliminate in a dream doesn't mean you're doing it in real life but it can sometimes lead to that especially if you're having that dream just as you're crossing over into waking that's when you have a risk of actually letting something out in the bed there um, and usually once that starts that will startle you awake or you'll wake before that another common theme in dreams is just home anything that has a sense of home usually a sense of familiarity and safety and quite often as we mentioned space time reality don't matter in a dream you can have a dream where it is at home at least that's where uh, in your mind in the dream I'm home but nothing about it is like your home the rooms are all different everything's really weird the place where it is is different but in your mind it's home so that can be different uh, and another one here this third bu third bullet if you've lived a lot of different places over your life there can often be one of those <clears throat> that more frequently shows up in your dreams as home that when you dream of home those are the places that or that's the place you tend to dream about and it may be that significant thing significant things happened there that uh, it was just the more comfortable safe feeling place that you lived or that's where the that's the place you lived the longest there can be all sorts of reasons why that is and related to home although this doesn't have to be home this can be any structure but it's most common in homes that you find hidden rooms or rooms you had forgotten about like you're going uh, somewhere and you see a hole in the attic and you crawl up into it and there's an entire space up there and maybe a desk or an entire room that you never knew was there or you find a door you never noticed before and there's an entire wing of your house that you didn't uh, be you weren't aware was there it can also be lost places so within the context of the dream once you find the room you realize oh I totally forgotten about this I used to come here a lot and there are old things that you haven't noticed in years there um, you can have dreams where you're going through some town and you come across a house or an apartment and you realize oh I used to live there and apparently for some reason no one else has lived there since you did so when you go there all your old stuff you've forgotten about is still there so there's a lot of variations that can happen there people in dreams as we mentioned you probably can make up new people uh, dead loved ones are very common to come in and out of dreams in fact once you've around the time period you've lost someone important to you uh, that could be through death or through for example a relationship breakup or someone moving away they may enter your dreams a lot for a period of time and then that may diminish over time and then you may have other moments later where they just for some reason keep popping in and showing up uh, what usually draws people into your dreams is during your waking life you've thought about them they've been queued up in some way so when your brain is in a dream state and it's looking for s people to throw into the dreams people you've recently encountered or thought about are the ones most likely to pop in 
So celebrities are really common. Musicians, actors, anyone else uh, can pop into your dreams. And when it comes to actors, it can be the actor or it can be a role they play that pops in. So um, maybe I have a dream of William Shatner, except he's not William Shatner. He's actually Captain Kirk uh, in the dream or the person shifts from the character they play to the real person. A lot of that can be influenced again by what you had been thinking about during your waking hours. Uh, if you spent the afternoon watching the original Lord of the Rings trilogy, or if you watch that right up till bedtime, you're almost guaranteed to have some dreams with that theme, parts of those themes, or having those characters popping in there. Pretty much guarantee there. Because again, one of the biggest things influencing dreams is memory processing and all those pathways it's firing up. Recent experience is more likely to influence the firing of pathways there. So what about recurring dreams? I got bread. similar to recurring memories in general. And these are ones that maybe you don't have them as much anymore, but there could be a period of your life where you had uh, these same kind of dreams a lot. Um, they may <clears throat> have had some sort of emotional impact, or it may just be that when you first had them, they were just very vivid and you remembered it very vividly, and that causes it to come back. Uh, a lot of people try to read things into recurring dreams there's not necessarily anything significant about the content. It's that your brain just draws that stuff up again uh, based on memories. So um, again, recurring memories are the same kind of process. Now here's the one you've been waiting for. Do your dreams mean anything? Oh man, this is great. Usually I can't get any kind of altitude. I have to, I keep running into telephone lines, power lines where I have to fly like I'm swimming or something, pedaling. This is great. Yeah. Except, well, yeah. No, it's good. It's all good. Flying dreams. Give me this. Can't remember what I was doing just before this. A little bit of dream I was in Uh-oh. And do we mean like a Freudian way? No. Is there universal meaning to dreams? If you fly, does that mean something? All sorts of videos out there telling you what your dreams mean if you have them. We have and bookstores, all sorts of books on dream interpretation. We have no evidence of any universal meaning for dreams. We can't put, for example, flying. Almost everyone, possibly everyone, has at some point dreams of flying. So it would be hard to put some specific significant meaning on that if it's something everyone has. But we can, as we've mentioned several times, keep track of your dreams over a period of time and start to see that there may be significance to you in those. We may start to see themes in there. As it lists on the slides here, it may give us an indicator of certain goals you have, things you would like to achieve or things that make you happy. Also, anxieties or insecurities pop in there. Something recent that's impacted you emotionally can go on in there for a while. In fact, let's go back uh, to a segment from the Why Do We Dream documentary and uh, the researcher who was doing numerical uh, data crunching on a dream. This one guy he was studying. Let's take another look. Uh, at this By comparing these elements against the norm, Zadra can interpret what someone's dreams mean. Blowing. There was coffee all over the counter and coffee just kept pouring out. P was yelling, what did you do, what did you do? But the mother keeps telling people it's all my fault. It's loud and I tried to defend myself. When I tried to move the car, the wheels just kept spinning. B was getting very upset. I got, I got back, back in, in, but nothing happened, just more spinning. 80% of these dreams contain some sort of misfortune. Yet on his database, Zadra finds the average occurrence of misfortune in the dreams of middle-aged men is just 30%.
almost all of the other dream characters in his dreams are women. And the interactions he has with these women is almost invariably negative. There seems to be concerns about relationship issues. He is definitely overwhelmed by factors which are impacting him negatively, but which he feels he has no control over. Dreams uh, do not hide their meanings, but are relatively transparent. And I think there is good evidence to suggest that dreams tend to reflect people's emotional concerns and also the things that preoccupy them in their social lives. Now the researcher may be getting a little too Freudian here with interpreting it. His data is great because again, what he did was he basically put together labels for all the dream elements, such as where they were, what was going on, is it failure, is there fear, what are the genders of the people or relations of the people. You can imagine you're gonna have a long list of categories and then he assigned a number to each category. So then he could data crunch that and see when, which things occur more often, which things maybe occur frequently together and get an idea of that particular person's dream trends. Um, now, just from that, you can't necessarily say a bunch about him. But if we knew more about him, what goes on in his life and the things, say we're in a therapy session or a counseling session with him and we get to hear what's going on, if we were to take that dream content, we may see, hmm, yeah, here's reflections of certain anxieties or insecurities. The guy in the documentary um, pointed out, um, apparently thinking the guy had a problem with women, that most of the people in his dreams are women, especially the ones criticizing him or getting on him about something. That could be an issue, but what we would need to know is how many of the people he experiences in his day-to-day -day life are women. Maybe he doesn't socialize very much, so at home it's his wife he's around most, and maybe he works in an environment where most of the other employees are women. It could just be that women are the majority of people around him in any given day. Therefore, they're the majority who are going to enter into a dream. Doesn't necessarily mean that he has a problem with women. So we would need to know more about him than just these patterns. But we definitely would probably see that he's insecure uh, or feels criticized or feels like he always messes up. So there's some insecurities and anxieties in there reflected in that, definitely. And you could see this, again, let's say you kept your sleep dream journal for a year, or let's say you've kept it for five years or whatever. You could, over time, especially if you had a general diary to parallel with it, you could see that when certain events happened in your life, that it influenced your dream patterns during that time. You may find, oh, I moved away and went to college, and here is a shift in a lot of the dream content I was having around that time. And then I moved somewhere else and started a new job, and here's another shift in dream content. Got into a very intense relationship with someone. I may be able to march, mark that here is another shift in dream content that was reflecting what was going on uh, in my life. So again, when it comes to the sleep dream journal here, one of the things we want to kind of think about um, when you go back over it, as far as if you could recall dreams, if you couldn't, you don't need to worry about this part of it. Again, just document the sleep pattern part of it. But if you did recall dreams, were there certain consistent people in it, uh, certain places that appeared a lot? If you were going to label the dreams by a mood, what is the word you would use to describe the mood that it fits? Was it dreamy? Was it happy? Was it sad? Was it scary? Things like that. And do you notice real life concerns being reflected in the dreams that you have? That's going to be a lot more important uh, in the next section because dreams related to anxiety and how anxiety influences dreams is a huge component of the last section we're going to go into on nightmares which is our next one. So let's head off and have some nightmares. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>